Thank you very much. I'm uh, Massimo Portincaso. I am now the chairman of Hello Tomorrow, which is the biggest deep tech community probably in the world. And we organize every year a big uh, challenge uh, that gives exposure to all the different startups. So if you plan uh, to have a startup, apply for the challenge. It's definitely a place where you should be. And with Hello Tomorrow and BCG, which is, as I can mention, my former employer where I was a partner, we have created a series of reports on deep tech and really created a little bit of the thought leadership around this. And uh, it's good that uh, <clears throat> Antonia was before me, so I don't need to explain you what deep tech is, uh, although I, I'll take a small detour there, but I think I want to put things in context and give you a little bit of background of where deep tech is coming and why are we talking about deep tech today. And uh, I think what we really need to do is uh, really start and go back and really understand that where we are today and deep tech is what uh, we call the fourth wave of innovation. And it started uh, back in with the first and the second industrial revolution. And actually, there was a lot of chemistry back then. The Aber Bosch process we're talking about to produce ammonia, the Bessemer process uh, to produce steel. There was a lot of these. There was also the electricity coming into place. There were all different uh, industries coming, and this created basically the foundation of the current civilization. This went on for a while, but then after second, the Second World War, there was a second phase of innovation that came into place. And this was the time of the big corporate labs and the states. And if there was a lot of atoms in the first wave, in the second wave, we started to bring together the two, but it was just the atoms that were enabling the, the bits, so to say. And this is the place where uh, we really started putting together a transistor. This is the time where we went to the moon. And this led to the next big wave of innovation um, because out of this wave, we also had the personal computer and we started the whole digital transformation that we've been talking about for the past decades. And uh, starting in the 80s, there was the uh, creation of a new wave of innovation that was fueled mostly by venture capital. And this is the, the wave that gave us, uh, based on the work done by the big Institute of Research and the corporate labs in the previous decades, this gave us basically to the, the, the internet first and then digital cloud and also biotech. Now what we're seeing is that basically each of these waves you can tell has built on the previous one. And we went from atoms and then we, we had two ways building on the bits side of things. And we are now in a place where we have a different model and a different approach to innovation where bits and atoms are coming together and are amplifying a lot uh, what is possible. And this is a, a little bit of the characteristic of what we call as deep tech as this fourth wave of innovation. And when I talk about deep tech, and I know as Antonio was mentioning, there are many definitions about it or many different way of looking at it. And one thing I'm really always very adamant about is not to consider deep tech as deep technology because there is not such a thing as a deep technology. Um, deep tech is an approach to, in, to innovation, and I'll explain in a second what we mean by that. But there are certain characteristics that are common that are slightly different from the one that Antonio mentioned. The first one is really that most of the deep tech ventures uh, are focusing on physical products. So it's not only about software, but it's really bringing together the bits at the atoms. And I think this is an important component, particularly when you start talking about uh, uh, electrocatalysis as we're doing today. And you might say it's bits, atoms, and electrons in this case. Um, the other part, and this came in all the talks that you've heard today, is that it's all about the ecosystem. It's about coming together of industry with research, with startups, with corporate, with government. It's really, it's, it, it's not the kind of innovation where two guys mostly um, um, can in a garage in the past just create uh, over a weekend uh, a, a startup. Um, you cannot do that. You really need to have the science, you need the ecosystem to work on it. The other element that we are seeing in all of this is this focus on fundamental issue. And if you have heard in all the talks, this really focus, okay, solving fundamental problem. It's not about optimize, it's not about the next marketplace, it's about solving fundamental issues. And the last point that we're seeing, and this is something that went a little bit under in the discussion today, but I think it's a very underestimated impact, is that where real big innovation is happening is at the convergence of technologies. And I'm going to explain in a second more precisely what we mean by that. But so <clears throat> we have seen we have 
the fourth wave, this is the wave in which we are now, we have four main attributes, but what does it mean for you concretely uh, as you're working on solving this problem? How can you apply this approach toward innovation in the work that you have been doing? And if you look at this, you can see there is a, a, a certain option space that is the one that traditionally is coming. This is the place where you're starting from. Um, and it could be that you've been, you know, chemistry, we've been looking at it very much from a, a thermal uh, catalysis point of view, or the, this, is, this is the classical piece. And, and current innovation would be at 10%, but the barriers to innovation are uh, almost disappearing, are really becoming smaller and smaller over time. So what becomes really important in this environment is that there is this problem orientation. And this is something that came across, Antonia mentioned this, and it's something that I cannot stress enough, is what is really important is that because the barrier of innovation are almost disappearing, it's really, really important that you focus on a problem to limit and also have a driver to bring all the opportunities uh, that are at hand uh, come to bear and help you to solve the problem. And what does it mean concretely? This means concretely that currently, not only the barrier to innovation are uh, becoming smaller and smaller, but there are two major forces that are really expanding dramatically the option space. And what I mean with uh, uh, what do I mean with option space? It means that today, in many instances, it is possible to achieve 10x improvement and not 10% improvement because of this option space. And that's why adding a problem orientation becomes really important because otherwise you can easily get lost or you end up with the classical hammer looking for the nails. So this is really important. And what are those two forces? It's basically two big convergences that are happening that are enabling the expansion of this option space. The first one is something that we have heard throughout through the different talks today uh, but it's something that is really, really important, is that this kind of innovation is happening because we have the convergence of science with engineering and design. is really about solving problems in a different ways. It's about <clears throat> bringing together science with engineering. It's not that you solve stuff, problem in the lab, you think and you try to find to solve a problem and you want to have the engineering backbone to be able to translate the science into a solution to a certain problem. So this is something really important. This is, this is basically the translation of what is called the Pasteur quadrant, where you have use of, ease of use, uh, use in mind and also a deep understanding of what is happening to lead to something um, that is really uh, uh, leading to a solution. So having those three things at the same time is really important. That's why you're seeing teams more and more in the deep tech space where you have a scientist, you have somebody with an engineering background or even a design, this founding team coming together to come up with these uh, solutions that are much bigger. The other very, very, very important uh, um, convergence which is taking place, and this is something that went also a little bit under today, but I really would love you to focus on this because I think it's really one of the key driver of these expanded option space is the convergence of technology. And uh, this is happening at three different levels. The current, let's say the, the classical digital wave happened mostly at the computational and, and cognition level. So it's AI, it could be quantum computing in a few years. This is where we have had a lot of digital and then we have added a lot of robotics. So sensing, motion, and this is the kind of uh, innovation that we have been used to. What has happened in the past years is that the advancement in the understanding of matter and energy have become so uh, advanced uh, that this has become to a certain extent an additional variable for innovation. And the biggest innovation we're seeing is happening at the intersection of the three things. When you bring computation together with robotics and matter, and energy, as in the case of electrocatalysis, this is where you're seeing the biggest amount of innovation. And I'll take an example which is different from, uh, from chemistry or material science, but somehow related, which is synthetic biology. Many people think that some of the biggest advances in synthetic biology has happened because of the advancement on sequencing, 
or the advancement on, uh, on, on editing or, or DNA synthesis. Yes, this is true. But what people for, forget is that when these came together with the computational power and also the process automation and the robotics, so this is also what made possible these advances in, in automation to, to bring down with the next generation sequencing, the cost of sequencing or the technology to be able to do some of the stuff on the synthetic biology side. When those, to, those three things came together, this is when we have had the, the biofoundries coming into place, when you have the ginkgo, the cymogen, that are now driving an incredible push uh, in terms of innovation happening in that space. And I think this is something that, when it comes to electrocatalysis, is something that you, you should really look at. How can I leverage computation, cognition? How can I leverage process automation to be able to overcome the engineering challenges or the science challenges or the design challenges that we're looking at? And when you start bringing all of these together, then you are able to basically make the big leap from the current option space to the outer uh, option space and have the 10x improvement that you've been looking at. And uh, I, I think Anka was talking about how long they took and then after a while then they managed to get speed with that. And this is really what allows you to go from that initial very little to this big improvement that's when you start bringing together all these different convergences. But there is another reason why deep tech is so important. This approach toward innovation is so uh, peculiar and so powerful. And this is uh, the factor of uh, the application of the design, build, test, learn cycle. And this is something that is, in my view, way uh, under uh, represented and under considered, but this is particularly important, and this is something that Ike has been talking about, and we have almost a similar uh, uh, kind of a spiral uh, that we've been having, and this is really important. The the convergence allows you to expand the option space, but the uh, the application of the design build test learn cycle allows you to basically compress and collapse the timeline. So things that used to take 20 years can now happen in a couple of years. Things that used to take months can happen now in terms of weeks. And this is really important. So you, this iteration, this, this fast cycle of iteration is really important. And why it is so important today compared to where it was in the past? I mean, the design build test cycle is nothing new and learn, you always did it, but in an implicit way. But what is changing now is in this context, because of also the convergence of technologies, each of these step of this design, build, test, uh, learn cycle has a very different impact in the way you look at things. So you can use generative design to create new solution. And instead of drafting one solution, you can have 10,000 of solution. If I think in terms of uh, uh, protein design, uh, for instance, then you can build them and it's uh, it, it, you can build them much, 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 much faster than before and test them. This allows you to generate, and you can use robotic automation to do this. You have heard today the importance of what Dense is doing, what uh, Metrom are doing. All of those things are going to allow all of you to go through this cycle much faster, generate data, much better data. You can then apply computation, run uh, AI on, on this one day, even quantum computing, and then you enter the next cycle of design. And then you can go through this cycle again and again, and every time you get closer to your goal and you can collapse the time. So <clears throat> as you go and you approach these with your uh, um, glasses of, of, of uh, somebody working on electrocatalysis, it's really important, identify the problem or rephrase the problem in a different way. I think this is really important. But bring together engineering, science, design from the very beginning, bring together the different technologies and see how you can leverage them and go through this design, build, test, learn cycle. And then you will be able to achieve fundamental innovations versus the, the classical 10% innovation that we're used to see in the corporate environment. And to, to what Antonio was saying before, this is something that only a startup in a position to do because there is this drive to solve a problem and also a necessity uh, to make it happen. While if you're a corporate and you do 10%, 10 everybody will be happy. Um, but uh, with a startup, you will not uh, for sure. So this is really, really important.
So, what are a kind of a, a heuristic for all of you to go through this and think, okay, how does this beautiful structure, conceptual work, how can I practically use it? How can I translate it into day-to-day -day work? And I think the way we are seeing this, we have identified uh, four different moments of truth. And I think those are the really the core question that each of you should be asking as you're going through this process. And we have the other side of the coin. Uh, Antonio spoke about BioNTech. I'm talking about Moderna here, but the end result is the same. And this idea is start really thinking, okay, could reality be different? Can how can I operate at this edge of the option space and not here? If you operate here, this is the reality you know, but could reality be different? So could it really be different? In the case of Moderna is, could instead of having something that you inject to do something, you can inject the code and have the body do it something for you. So this is a really a very different way of looking at it. Or if you take the example, we spoke about ammonia production and one of the biggest uses of ammonia is for fertilizer and the way of looking at reality in a different way is to say, what if instead of producing ammonia to distribute it to plants, I produce microbes which fixate directly ammonia onto the roots of plants. It's a completely different way of framing the problem and then you can solve it the way they're doing it with uh, uh, synthetic biology. So very different way of looking at reality. Then is there a way to make it possible? This is when you start bringing the science um, together, can you really make it possible? And, and and then this was really, okay, can we get mRNA to do this in the case of Moderna or in the case of um, uh, the um, ammonia uh, production and um, nitrogen fixation, can I create the bacteria to produce uh, and fixate it? Then can you, we build it today, can you do the first step? Can I get quickly to an MVP? Even if it is a scrappy MVP that works, it doesn't have to be perfect, but can I get this to work? it's really important quickly. And this is the other part that you really need um, to do it. So in the case of Moderna, it was the COVID vaccine. And then can this become the new normal? And can we sh can we have this shift from thermal uh, catalysis to, to uh, electrocatalysis? Can we have, find a new way to leverage uh, this approach? What is important and tricky um, to be done into this environment is that as these questions look very nicely on this slide and it looks like it's a nice sequence, but the real art is that you need to ask the last question from the very beginning. So you need to start with the end in mind. You need to start thinking about this. Can I do it in a way which is economically viable? Because if you do it and if you manage to, to build it, but it has a cost which is 100x of what it is today and will never be able to go down, then you're not helping yourself. You're just wasting your time. So it, it needs to, 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 to verify this problem market fit that, that we've been talking about. The other thing we've been talking about is really the importance of the ecosystem. You have heard it many times today, so I'm not going to invest too much time, but it's really on, on, on talking about this, um, but it's really you need to be part of this. And that's why when, when I can, said, I'm going to do these uh, material pioneers community to say, yes, that's absolutely the right thing. I really want to help you in doing this because that's the way you drive innovation. It's with things like Inan, when you bring people together and you need to exchange forces, but it's also what is really important is that the mentality when you do deep tech innovation is a mentality of growing the pie and making your slice bigger instead of the classical mentality, which is common in the industry and many other places of trying to get the biggest slice of the pie. And some of you know deep tech ventures are naturally born this way, but as we've heard, many of these uh, actors are not there yet. Universities need to understand tech transfer is a big issue. Venture capital investors, some understand how to invest in deep tech, but many don't because they think it's riskier than it is or it takes more time than it does and they don't know what they need to do because they have learned to do software or biotech investment. Corporation has absolutely no clue how to deal with it and how to absorb it and government and also learn. So there is a lot that needs to happen. It's improving, dramatically improving. There's been a lot of speaking about this, but as you approach this work with things like VoltaCam, I in uh, uh, materials pioneers or hello tomorrow. These are the places that really help to grow the community and it's going to make possible to achieve great results.
And this is just one example. If you look at textile, there is a lot of problem with textile, but there are a lot of barriers and these problem with textile and, and, and the sustainability of the fashion industry cannot be solved because people don't want to invest. Um, they're trying to get the exclusive, but if you get exclusive, you cannot get up the volume. If you don't get up the volume, the price is not okay. And there is a bit of a, a, a death spiral here. So you really need to look at this systemically as a disruption, as an example. So here a lot, uh, I spoke about deep tech in general, but there is one subset within uh, um, deep tech, which I think is particularly relevant for electrocatalysis. And this is something where I would like to spend the rest of the time. And, and it's based on the idea of leveraging the design, build, test, learn cycle, the problem orientation, and all of the um, uh, deep tech, uh, let's say, practices and, and ideas that are behind these. And the idea is about nature co-design because for the first time in this first wave, in this fourth wave, for the first time in, in history, uh, we are in the position to utilize nature as an engineering manufacturing platform. When I speak about nature co-design, I very often focus a lot on the synthetic biology side of things where you use organism to do it, but this actually applies very much on the inorganic side of things. It's just only that it is less developed. And the reason why I want to talk to you today about nature co-design and also reference a lot what synthetic biology has been doing is because I think that I deeply believe actually that uh, the, the, the inorganic side of things of nature co-design, electrocatalysis among these, is in the same place where synthetic biology was basically 10 years ago. 10 years ago, this was just getting started and this is where it is today. And, and these convergences, we're starting to see companies like uh, uh, BS Particle, they're starting to work at the, the convergence. They're working with uh, AI, they're working with automation, they're working with matter and the nanoparticles. And this is where you're starting seeing the creation of this platform, these paradigm changes that can really drive a lot of innovation. That's why I would love to discuss with you and go through it. It's not directly um, inorganic, but I think you can see a lot of inspiration and a lot of parallel to what has happened on the synthetic biology side that can be applied also on the electrocatalysis world. So what is the characteristic of nature co-design? <clears throat> One, they really are, uh, it's really built on the design, build, test, learn cycle. A reality for synthetic biology, much less so on the inorganic side. It builds on the inorganic and organic matter and operates at the nano level. This is really uh, the piece and utilizes the, the nature. It could be nano forces, it could be a flow of electricity, it can be also the way organisms work and DNA, but it uses this really fundamental principle to, to do stuff and provides a huge opportunity uh, to create sustainable um, um, progress and also profitable progress. And what is underlying because of this, uh, we have heard many people talking today about CO2, talking about different things. And, and I think that one of the things that uh, get a bit lost in the discussion about what is happening is that with the fourth wave and with nature co-design, we have the incredible possibility to have a radical shift in terms of paradigm um, based on which our industrial economical tissue is built. Currently, our economical industrial tissue is built on an exploitative paradigm. It's about extracting petroleum, uh, from the ground and putting energy to break down the molecules uh, and put energy to refine them and then to reassemble them. Or we're putting a lot of energy to breed uh, cattle uh, or, or silkworms and we can really do it in a different way. We can really, instead of taking things that are bigger and breaking them down, we can really do something different and uh, bringing things together at the atomic level leveraging the power of electricity and electrons to drive some of these. So it's it's a generative approach. And this is a, it's a big, big shift. I'm not talking about regenerative, I'm talking about generative. And this is a very, very big shift. All of our economy is built on the left paradigm and we have the possibility over the next 20 years to move to the right side, but we need all of you on this call and many others to really drive to this generative shift. And these are examples, you can see it, this is with uh, silk bioproduction. 
This is how this is happening. And this is a little bit the fundamental piece. You have atoms, small molecules, and you have a macrostructure. You break it down, and then you have a final product. Or you can go the other way around and generate. So the question to you, and I, I want this talk also to be a bit of a source of um, question marks for you and, and a source of hopefully some inspiration to think, OK, what does it mean for me? How are we going to apply this for electrocatalysis? What is the generative route for electrocatalysis? And one of the reasons why you need to do it is uh, not only this is um, important for the world and is going to address some of the biggest challenging uh, problem that we have, but it's a huge economic opportunity because we have the possibility to basically redo everything which has to do with manufacturing and every, redo everything which has to do also to a certain extent uh, with our economy. So we're talking about trillions. I, I'm not going to say this is 30 trillion or 29 trillions, but it's really, really a big impact on the economy and everything that we touch. So. The first four core learnings, and you have heard some of it during the different presentation when Gabriele spoke about it also in some of, of, of this stuff, but there are four uh, impacts that this shift is going to have on value chains, and I've heard a lot of it today. The first one is that when you operate with nature co-design, when you operate with the generative mode, you have a much level, uh, higher level of precision. So you can identify what you want to produce and how you want to produce it, and you can create and shift value. This is something really important to go back to what Ike uh, was saying, that it took them four years, five years to understand where they were. But ultimately, I think one of the core role that was played in the decision where to land was really to understand how, can, how and where can we create most of the value with what we're doing, because you can do stuff that other people cannot do because you are building from the ground up and you're not coming top down and breaking things down. So you have a very different level of precision and it's really important that you are aware of that to be able to identify the biggest value pools because these are the ones that are gonna drive your economics. And I'm gonna get to the economics in a second. The second thing, and this is something that Gabriel uh, uh, mentioned, is um, and that we heard also in previous uh, with uh, um, I think E-Refinery was also talking about this, um, but this idea of there is a shift from value chain to value nets. You can really start using CO2 in a different way. You can start use uh, exhaust uh, in a different way. You have a way more integrated uh, way of thinking about these things. So it's not about the classical value chain with waste coming out of it, but you can think in a different way. And you you, you don't you basically have feedstock ultimately you don't have waste um, and and you have resources coming out of this. The last point is, the, the, the third point is that the economics when you start applying and operating with this new paradigm, the economics are very different and I'm gonna dig double click on this because I think it's very important. And the last point to go to some of the stuff that Antonia was also referring to is there is a different requirement in terms of understanding the science behind it. It's not about doing, I don't know, an app uh, for to collect pet food. Um, this is about fundamental science and you're going to need really counterpart in the industry um, or in the government to really understand what you're doing and also for your team. So. To give you an example different from, um, from this on how you can really apply this bottom-up uh, approach is this is the example that came uh, out of uh, collagen. Collagen is uh, a product is basically made with the carcass of animals. It gets boiled and then collagen gets produced. And what the company did, which is called Geltor, um, they basically said, okay, we're going to use organism to produce collagen. And they have now moved to a place that not only they use a different approach and uh, uh, they can produce collagen utilizing organism through fermentation, but what they have done is that they have introduced the idea of the ingredient as a service. So basically you can go there and say, I want a collagen with these and these and these and this characteristic, and then they're gonna produce the collagen that you need. And, and this is a complete shift because before uh, the value there was created in which you were producing a collagen that was not 
smelling fishy because a lot of fish was used to produce collagen and that looked human. So with a color that uh, didn't, didn't uh, um, uh, wasn't different from the color of the skin. And now you can go there and say, you know what? It's not only about uh, creating a commodity, we are doing something that is really, really specific. And this is really important because this allows you to drive value and ask for different prices. And it allows you to also um, decommoditize some of the stuff that you're doing. And why I'm emphasizing this? I'm emphasizing this because we are competing with an industry that has had more than 100 years to perfect their processes. They are built at huge scale. And we're talking about really investment that are in the billions for those plants, very centralized production, trying to go and compete purely on the scale and the cost is going to be a suicide. So it's really important that as you go through this exercise, you only think about, okay, what's the value that I can create? And the value can be better performance. It can be that I'm quicker, faster. Um, you can switch or better properties. I don't know, you need to find it yourself, but the, the famous problem that you're solving, the problem, the importance of the problem equates to the value that you can create. And this is what is going to drive a lot of your economics. And one example here is, for instance, Sila Nanotechnologies. They identify the, the problem, say, okay, lithium ion batteries, there is a limit to the, the density of the energy that can be stored there and work to substitute the anode from graphite the, and to, to silicon. And, and they did it in a way <clears throat> in which they, they were, basically they managed to do it with a drop-in, so considering all the infrastructure that was in place, but also adding value because they were able to deliver higher density. But they didn't start in the place with the biggest market, which was the one for car batteries. They started in the place where they were creating the highest value, which was batteries for phones because uh, the cost is, even if the cost is higher, the battery part is a very small percentage of the total cost of a phone and you care a lot about the battery on your phone so that the people will be willing to pay more for it. And if they're gone directly to the, and they can start generating, produce the volume, drive down the cost, and then be able to sell to car producer. If they started directly there, they've been competing and they would never been really um, competitive with uh, with the current uh, anodes that are in the production process. So I think this is something that is really important to consider. The other part is this is really very specific for uh, synthetic biology, but I can tell you that for sure five or let's say four out of uh, uh, six of these points are very relevant for electrocatalysis as well. And this is to, to show you, you really need to understand the economics to be able to come up with the right solution. The first one is bigger is not better. And we have heard from Gabriele that this new way, these micro reactors, this different approach toward the, 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 the reactors is very different from the current one. It's a way more distributed world. This is the same is true for synthetic biology. So this has very different uh, economics, economical implication in all of these. If you look at the scaling up challenge, it's when you start from the bottom, uh, when you start at the atomic level, building things on top of it is difficult and you need to have it on your radar screen from the very moment when you start. And things that work in the lab don't, doesn't necessarily work at the scale where you need them. Design to cost is really important. Thinking about it from the very beginning, because maybe just changing a few parameters at the beginning, you can end up with a very different result. And incorporating these into your design, build, test, learn cycle is really important. It's an equation. It's not something that you go and deal with at the end. You need to design to cost and value from the very beginning. And the point that I made about uh, the experience curve, um, uh, what, what happened with Sila nanotechnologies is a, is a very, very important one. So think about it. How can I drive my cost? How can I start with high value, low quantity, and move things down so that I can generate the experience curve and, and have the right value strategy? And the question that I would ask to all of you is, you know, in synthetic biology, what happens is that basically you have two different kinds of capex. You have one capex, which is the steel that you use to produce the stuff, but then you have the organisms, which is another kind of capex, but you can still determine the yield, the titer, and many other things in the way you design your 
um, your organism. So what is the organism of electrocatalysis is the nanoparticles you use, is the way you, you which are the characteristics that have the big impact that they can really drive the economics um, and play a role as uh, of your capex as you develop these. And, and the last point is uh, uh, something which is, uh, uh, let's say, um, interesting to see if you look at what has happened on the synthetic biology side with precision fermentation. This is something that each of you should be really asking yourself because what happened with precision fermentation, this is the cost development of precision fermentation. And this is a logarithmic scale and really went down and you can really see when uh, precision fermentation started becoming relevant for the different categories. So before this level, it was only for medicine. Then down this level, up to this level, it has been for cosmetics. The, now it's coming to materials and now is entering the place to do food. So the question that you should ask yourself is what is the curse curve that we're working on for what you're doing? And what are my uh, value driver or let's say my target market or the problem that you're trying to solve with your pieces and where do you think to get there? I think this is what you really need to start thinking about it because yes, you have the possibility to go to the outer space and um, actually I can stop sharing, I think, um, yeah, and then just speaking. I don't know if you are seeing me. Um, but uh, ultimately, what, what you really need to, um, to think is, yes, I can expand the option space. I can really create um, solutions that are radically different, uh, but how can I accelerate the process? What is my strategy? How do I approach this? And there are many, many questions that you need to have in mind when you go through that. So I, I'm done with that, uh, Ike. So... If you want, I can go on. I can talk about investing in deep tech and many other things, but uh, I, I would rather open it for, for, for questions, yeah, if there are any. Thanks, uh, Massimo. I think uh, this already was a very interesting uh, continuation of the introduction that Antonia gave. Um, and again, I'm really impressed by the enormous depth of the, I would say, the description of the ecosystem and the fourth wave of uh, deep tech. Um, I thought I knew a lot uh, seeing this presentation. Uh, I still learned a lot of new things, but first and foremost, at least for myself, it gives me a lot of hope for the future. If you see that that this this fourth revolution is converging the different technologies um, um, and also changing this fundamental from extracting to uh, regenerative or generative, I think that's very, very positive. And I think it fits really nicely with with what we are trying to accomplish with vs particle um, and coming back to your point i realized that just doing it on ourselves was not sufficient uh, because in a in an event like today with all the different angles um highlighting this this acceleration of uh, the development it makes complete sense what vsp is doing uh, but just if you look at vsp on itself and the way we are making nanoparticles at the push of a button or whether really accelerating this design build test learn cycle um, maybe researchers are are skeptical but but now looking into it from this broader perspective i think it, it really fits um, so thanks uh, thanks a lot for uh, sharing your insights and also making all the connections to the previous talks and uh, maybe the talks coming after so the floor is open for um, um, questions So just raise your hand or unmute yourself. Well, people are shy. I want a couple of things to, to, to build on what Antonio was saying. The one thing that I didn't address today because I thought I wouldn't have at the time, but we have published two reports. One, uh, and you can go on Edo tomorrow, there is a site and you can download the two reports, one on deep tech and one on nature co-design, which I encourage you to do. But we're, we have realized that there is a lot of potential, but the investor model is not there yet. Um, and it's very difficult to get uh, uh, investor to understand the potential 
understand the science and really see all of these. So we have written now, we're working on a third report that which come out next month on really explaining how deep tech investors need to, to take all these, the way they need to look at it, the role they play in helping mitigating risk, helping them to really being problem oriented, help the, the startup to grow to the, the DPTL cycle. So those are all things that uh, we are addressing in the next report. Maybe uh, Massimo, you can stop sharing the screen because now I'm uh, looking at myself. Um, oh yeah, stop sharing. Then we have uh, more room for different. So a question uh, coming from uh, from my side. In the essence, what is it very interesting is that both synthetic biology, but also um, uh, next generation electrocatalysts, are trying to create the same solution. Um, is taking carbon dioxide and bringing it back into useful chemicals. You can use either an organism and change its DNA, or you can use nanoparticles and change their size to make them more effective. I think definitely when we are doing the next uh, summit uh, later this year, we should try to get more people from the synthetic biology side in. Because, yeah, why shouldn't we just join forces? Because we are solving the same problem. Yes. Um, same holds maybe also for, for food. Um, there are now many companies that are trying to grow synthetic meat, so not coming from an animal directly, but growing it in a lab, um, which is also closely re re connected to um, 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 the whole movement that you are describing. Um, and in, in some sense, food is also a type of material, so that's there's definitely a lot of room to learn from each other. Um, and also from our side, the same nanoparticles that we are using to develop next generation electrocatalysts are also used to develop next generation biosensors or bioelectronics. So where, where we can bridge um, the different world from, from, from electrons in a computer system or photons to, um, let's say, electrical signals that a biological system understands. So there's also a lot of room to improve this, this connection um, and, and leverage the knowledge of the different ecosystems. And this is something that few people have seen, but basically the moment you take out thermal catalysis out of the equation, because you know you don't have much biology within thermal catalysis, <laughs> it's dead by then. But the moment you take out of the equation, then the two worlds come, the organic and inorganic world come much, 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 much closer. And that's the way we need to start looking at this. And that's one of the reasons why I insisted with the team. At the beginning, I had pushback from the team and I said, no, it's nature for design. It's not synthetic. It's the two things and there is an organic and inorganic component, but it's a continuum. You cannot say here one finishes and the other one starts. Um, uh, Antonio spoke about this startup doing nanoparticles for health science, for life science, for cancer. It's a continuum and that's the way, it, it's a big different mindset that is required by researchers and um, and it's another convergence which is happening, uh, but also from investor to sit in a different way, uh, absolutely. There was another question coming up from me, but it's also for Antonia. Um, um, both of you mentioned that uh, corporates are um, not designed in the most effective way to to nurture this the, these type of ecosystems or these type of disruptive uh, changes, but still you see many companies starting these challenges. So they say we are looking for new solutions in this and this space. So we create a, a prize, uh, we name it uh, the, the 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 challenge of this company, and then they ask startups to apply for it and um, promote their solution. Um, what, what is your view on that? Is that, a, is that a good approach to to interact with startups via these challenges? Same as what Elon Musk did with the, the Hyperloop uh, uh, challenge. I, I think it's definitely, I don't know if the challenge by itself is the panacea, the panacea to really solve the problem, but definitely what the smart companies have understood is that the way you do R&D has completely changed. And basically the equivalent is, if you look in the second wave, you have these big corporate labs, those days are gone, you're not gonna have them. Then in the third wave, those labs were kind of destroyed and the only one having it are the funds, so Facebook, Google, and so on. Now we're coming to a place where you can basically externalize the corporate labs and have a lot of uh, innovative startups doing this because the barrier to enter the capability, there is a startup working on nuclear fusion. It used to be something that states used to do, and now a, a startup is working on getting corporate and nuclear fusion in seven days, seven uh, years. 
Um, so they need to understand it, but it's not easy. It took 40 years for R&D, uh, for biopharma to understand how to harness this external uh, innovation piece and how to digest it. Uh, because the big problem is that these big companies are set up to uh, optimize and, and iterate on, on a certain business model, while the, the startup are there to come up with things that basically attack the, the big machines. So you, it, it's not so easy for them to find the, uh, the right balance, but you're seeing some of them and, and the good ones are, are doing it um, to a certain extent. But I would be interested in Antonia, if she's still there, what she has been seeing. I think she's currently out of the meeting. Again, the floor is open for uh, for questions uh, coming from the audience. So if you have any interesting thought that you want to share, um, feel free to just unmute yourself and uh, uh, post a question. In the meantime, I have another question. Uh, so one, one, I would say, institution that really intrigues me is uh, flagship pioneering, uh, where they are trying to institutionalize uh, the creation of new startups like Moderna mm -hmm. uh, based on um, um, uh, synthetic biology or what we have seen in, in that area. Um, I think in the inorganic space, you, you see companies like Enum or institutes like Enum at least fostering, mm -hmm. um, helping startups. Um, but I think it would be very useful to to take all the best practices from synthetic biology and try to replicate it, um, uh, also for inorganic materials and and really speed up this process because um, I think we have two great examples coming up at the end of this day of uh, U.S. based companies mm -hmm. um, really bringing those new electrocatalysts to the market. But we need many more. Uh, to really accelerate this shift. Um, what, what is your opinion on that part? I, I think there is a precondition for that uh, before it happens, and it was on one of your chart. The reason why flagship has been successful is that the development time is in the year's time there and not in the decades. So we need first to bring down the time from 20 to two years, and then you're going to have a flagship pioneer uh, for inorganic, for sure. I see a hand raised from uh, Lars uh, Banco. Uh, feel free to uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask the question. Yes, hi, this is Lars from uh, University Bochum. Um, I have a question. So we um, might have a technology that is interesting, and um, but we are in the pre-seed stage. And my question would be, when would you start to open up to accelerators, investors, and so on? What, what should you have before you, you start this process? I'll, I'll tell you relatively easy. We just finished the, the, the report and we spoke really to the best uh, um, investor from DCVC to Lux Capital, SOSV, so Indibio and, uh, and many others. Everybody, everybody told us, I'm not going to invest in science risk. So the moment you have retired your science risk, you should start talking to people. But before that, don't do that. So if your science is working, then you have an engineering problem and then you can start looking. And it really depends on the money that you need to scale um, the, the, the science, so the engineering. Uh, but that's when you should start looking. Thank you. Another question, uh, I think, from uh, Anka. Yes, thank you, Aika. So I enjoyed a lot your your presentation, Massimus, and and such a, such a clear view on on these developments, also in timeline. And I I wonder when when you are talking about shortening the timelines, there will be uh, there is something that sometimes my colleagues from the lab tell me. Um, they say, okay, it takes nine months to make a a, a baby. <laughs> if you put three women on it, it doesn't. Yeah, it's yeah, not going to take three months, right? Um, and I know. Um, there is there is a certain timeline that you cannot shrink anymore, right? And not every development can be can, can be shrank. It just it just takes time. And I wonder if um, if we can distinguish between this um, if uh, uh, let's say the developments in uh, um, on, um, on on IT or or other type of developments like that can they be 
compared and is the model of, of developing companies and, and uh, there, is it translatable to materials, which normally yes. take 20, 30, 50 years to, to actually come to a, a real maturity? I would really, really push back on this. Um, and this is the same way you could have had the same discussion on biology. It's just, of course, if you have with your pipette to do one test and wait one week for this to replicate and then another week to do the analysis and you do one test. If you can do in those two weeks, instead of doing one test, you can do 200,000 tests, 200,000. I'm not talking about two, but 200,000 and generate the data out of it. Then instead of doing 300 cycles to go through it, you're going to do 30. And then for each cycle, I still think you can shorten the time. So maybe let's say you have, uh, let's do the math. Let's, let's say, okay, we can shave off a little bit of time. So from 10 months, we go to eight months for one cycle. But instead of doing 300 cycles, you do 30. You have reduced your time by more than a factor of 10. And that's what I mean, it's just the precision. And that's why it's important that you start with the problem because if you start going into all the space and you try all the different alternatives, it's gonna take a lot of time. But if you have a problem and you bring all the technology you need to solve this problem and then iterate quickly and, and learn out of it, you can really compress that time. You can really compress it. I think it's uh, um, it, it has been proven again.